Welcome and aloha. I am Mark Schlaff, the host of FinTech's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea of current events with my guest, Joshua Michaels. Sometimes the polarizing noise of the world and even our Hawaii seems like waves pounding on the beach, drowning out the voices of those calling out to others. Josh Michaels is an attorney who has been shouting over those waves to get out his message concerning his view of current events in the world. To do this, Josh and his friend Ryan Little co-founded the Blue Hawaii podcast, which Josh says rants about the daily news. Josh has also written articles for various publications concerning many current issues, and he's not shy on social media. Josh wants his voice to be heard and to reach others in the community. And to be clear, all of the comments that Josh makes today on this program are his personal views. All right, Josh, welcome. Uh, good to see you. Uh, and I want to I want I want to start off before we get into your 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 views. I want to focus a little bit and talk a little bit about you. And you know, you're at the beginning of your legal career, having passed the bar in 2015, and you still find time to shout out to others about current controversial issues. And before we discuss your particular views on those issues, I want to ask you, why do you do it? What motivates you to shout over the waves so others will hear you, especially in these, these polarized times? Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that gracious intro, Mark. It's great to be with you. Um, I like shouting over the waves a lot more than screaming into the void, which is what it feels like sometimes. Um, Oh, so blanket on a blanket level, sure. There's a there's a healthy there's a healthy dose, especially with the podcast with my friend Ryan and I. Uh, there's a healthy dose of overeducated millennial narcissism that drives a lot of it. So that that is, and that's probably the social media too as well. Um, but essentially, well, we found uh, Ryan's more of an extrovert. I'm more of an introvert. For him, it was more you know we need to reach out to to build connections with people and help help each other understand what's going on. For me, I need somebody to validate sort of like, am I seeing this? Is everybody else seeing this? Are we going crazy? And around the time of the um, the false missile alert, that's when it occurred to us that like, well, as far as out in the world, you know, two random Howley lawyers from Hawaii sharing view, what, when, when, if any, at, at any time at all, could we be interesting to the outside world? Uh, and that's that's when we decided to take the plunge. Uh, as for the writing, that is, you know. Uh, as the as the son of an English teacher, uh, I've always I've always turned to words to express myself. I never got the STEM gift for understanding how the world works. Uh, but for me, rather than you know, I write I write these things. I put them out there. I'm not necessarily trying to persuade anybody, but a lot of the times that's how I think through issues myself. Develop you know develop the thoughts and sort of put it out there and and hopefully get feedback, good and well, bad. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of feedback, I mean, yeah. is is it always positive or is there negative feedback or both is, it, what, oh, is that? sure it's it's yeah a healthy a healthy robust mix of both um the the i would say the show the, the podcast has been on hiatus since uh since the turn of the year but overall probably i'd say 90 percent positive of that 90 percent uh 85 percent was the friends and family unremittingly positive. I'm not going to tell you anything negative about it, et cetera. Um, some positive, you know, uh, the most helpful suggestion we got starting off was, uh, especially for, for people listening in the car with their windows down on busy streets, you may want to start, you know, putting a little bleeper over some of the, some of the rhetoric. Um, of, the, of, the, of the few, you know, quote unquote negative comments, beyond, uh, beyond you know, uh, the what's left on the internet anonymously describing, you know, opinions about uh, uh, some of our speaking voices or et cetera. Uh, the constructive, there was a lot of constructive criticism at least. So people, you know, yes, the haters hate as they say, but even the haters, I think, wanted to see us try a little bit harder. So there, yeah, 
it's it's it, you take it and that's i'm sure you've you you know that as as part of putting your putting any opinion out there and especially nowadays and well I, I guess the other good thing about this is people are talking sure you know, sure. people are communicating with each other i think that's important and so that that's a a byproduct in a way maybe it's the goal but it's also a byproduct both yeah of your of your getting out there and talking. Okay, now I want to focus on some of the particular issues that you believe are important to shout about. Sure. Uh, it, you know, you, you you have shouted that there is danger in romanticizing history, with reference, particular reference to MAGA, and there's also danger in recency bias. Now I, I want what, you know what are you talking about? What what is romanticizing history and re recency bias? Explain those. Sure. So there's sort of uh, there's sort of two sides of a coin in terms of how uh, history, historical memory influences culture, especially our political culture. Um, you know, recency. The excuse me. The idea of uh, romanticizing history. Uh, it's obvious with you know the Donald Trump 2016, 2016 campaign MAGA. Um, a lot of what Donald Trump did. He made a lot of the things that have been subtext in our politics for a very long time. He made them explicit text, um, and the 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 clear romanticizing history, the idea that uh, everything would be fine if we could go back to some imagined time in our history, when you know back in the 1950s, let's say everything was better, everything was gravy. And this is you know Donald Trump is not a unique phenomenon by any means. Just he's a product of this particular time and these particular moments that we found ourselves in. But a lot of these currents repeat throughout. Uh, throughout American history, you know, uh, periods of expansion, uh, liberalization, progressivism are followed by some would say a backlash, some would, you know, some would say a reclaim, a reclamation of the way things ought to be. Um, recency bias is the uh, is the other side of that. Recency bias is the idea, um, and this is it goes. This transcends politics and culture. This is this is human psychology. The focus on uh, our immediate experience, what we know about what we what is going on and what just happened, what is freshest in our minds, that is most informative to us going forward. So the um, this is why, for example, uh, this is this is what enabled Hillary Clinton to to uh, rebut "Make America Great Again" with "America is already great." And sure, in a certain school of thought, recency bias. Uh, that that makes a lot of sense, but that that did not resonate with nearly as broad spectrum of of the populace as she would have hoped. And the uh, the, the Yale University historian Timothy Snyder explains these contrasting systems. Um, on one hand, you've got the um, pre twenty sixteen the the Obama Clinton West Wing Aaron Sorkin sort of model recency bias uh, where history is linear. This is the uh, the famous Martin Luther King quote. Uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The idea that uh, there are some bumps along the way, but by and large, history is constantly a series of us figuring out things, getting better, more and more people entering the marketplace of ideas, entering society. There's only one way to go but up. And the reason that so often uh, when society hits these breaking points, you know, every, every few generations, um, Great Recession, World War II, World War I, uh, the reason that the people on the linear train don't necessarily see that coming is on the other side, and this transcends left-right ideology. This is this is different people find themselves in different. This is just human. Or, you orient yourself into one of two ways. Um, the other side of that, the the romanticizing history side, history is not linear. History is a story, a cyclical story of us versus them, and us. We are our people, our glorious history. Both suffering, a lot of suffering is great for the narrative, but but you know, un, also unredeemed promise. And if we could just get rid of them, if we could just keep them away, not let them into our business, everything will work out. And without history as a context, uh, depending on where you are, Donald Trump for a lot of people, he's you know he's a. a, a an iconoclastic savior who's going to, you know, throw out the system, you know, the QAnon, he, he's going to bring the storm. He is going to be like the great redemption that, that free, you know, restores America. Uh, for a certain other side, let's say like the, the, you know, not necessarily grounded in history, but maybe a little, a little too much MSNBC, Rachel Maddow. Um, he's, you know, he's basically the reincarnation of Hitler. And the idea <laughs> that like, 
the you uh, this is this is human this is dualistic and this uh, dualistic nature our dualistic nature in general is exacerbated by this partisanship where it's all or nothing it's everything is great or everything is terrible there's no, and the idea of being being aware of both of these biases and uh, the goal hopefully the goal is to try to assess the situation as clearly the present situation as clearly as you can knowing the history that led you there how you got there uh, and and what it means in terms of you know history is more than just facts history is the meaning of like what does it mean uh, what does it mean to be here in this moment where we are rather than what does it mean for ideology like what does it mean for all of us irrespective of the the view you take on it and how do we figure out how to live together so well, these are, I guess, these, yeah you know you know so what I hear you saying is that the danger of these that ne neither of these are uh, uh, good on their own, and yeah. and and they they create a polarization, and that's what I hear you saying. Some some people want to go back in history, and some people say, oh, "No, everything's all right." But there really probably is. It sounds like a middle ground that should be reality. Is that? Am I seeing that correctly? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, the 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 danger of any time, uh, and and. Again, un totally unconsciously, you know, uh, nobody nobody looks at a situation and thinks to themselves, "I'm going to impose my ideology onto the situation." For a lot of us, depending on you know our childhood, our backgrounds, our experience, our conditioning, how we've made our way in the world, a lot of us, most of us actually, are just goldfish in a bowl. You know, the goldfish doesn't know what water is. It's just sort of that's the way things are. That's you know, uh, especially the more and more atomized and fragmented our communities get and you only know your your in, your immediate surroundings and so and so and it also sounds like donald trump really saw a avenue sure. on this uh romanticizing history i mean that i mean he he saw that there is a a group of people in our country that that appeals to that that mm -hmm. theory appeals to mm -hmm. absolutely oh. those but yeah, he he um you know uh agree or agree or disagree about a lot of things but the man has a talent for identifying uh an audience's buttons what buttons to push to invigorate the audience for good or for bad um but you know he he did not happen in a vacuum he had plenty of probably the most the best example of a model of how this thought, uh, this this ideology has been harnessed over the past few decades. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, his media empire throughout the Anglosphere, the UK newspapers, our Fox News, the Australian uh, the Australian media ecosystem, um, the he he figured out pretty early on there is a lot of money to be made stirring up a particular kind of nativist left behind grievance that feels under siege. You know, you know, this is a really interesting and, and uh, it's, it, now it, 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 <laughs> it, it kind of comes together for me now that those are really good points. Thank and I, I can now see uh, what appeals to people on, on this idea of romanticizing history. And it, it actually it has been taken advantage of and taken advantage really of people too. I, I Completely. see. Completely. Now look, we, we we can talk for hours on this topic, but I want to sure. talk about a few more of the things that you've raised that you've sure. shouted about, uh, and and in in our time here, just to cover a few of the the ideas because, but that was an important one. That was a good one. Um, now you you've also talked about something that's really interesting to me, and that's right wing populism. Sure. Uh, and you say it's been exported around the world. What are you talking about again? Tell me, so, explain that to me, because I I do see. A lot of oligarchs around the world yeah. and dictators, and it's coming up. And you know, I, I grew up post-war sure. uh, in the United States and World War II, and trying to figure out how can this happen. So, what, what are you talking about? Well, exactly like you say, um, you know, approaching the end of World War II in the post-war era, you know, um, when Europe and the idea of the old established international world order was left in tatters. Uh, it was a conscious and unconscious decision by America to sort of be the world guarantor of security and to uphold what, you know, the quote unquote post-war liberal international order. The idea, you know, 
the, the um, without getting too much into this, the, the, you know, the idea Western, the Western model of democracy uh, is inevitable. That's going to hold up forever. And this is sort of redoubled upon once the Soviet Union falls. Um, Francis Fukuyama famously declares the end of history. Uh, right wing populism, we've seen this resurgence, you know, not just Trump, uh, even before Trump, uh, the Brexit vote in Britain. Uh, we've got cousins similar around the world. Uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, Bibi Netanyahu in Israel, uh, Orban in Hungary. Um, the idea is right when right wing populism is it moves be it, it moves beyond simply conservative rule. You know, we've seen uh, you know the George W. Bush administration, for example, a quote unquote neoconservative following in a tradition. Still, you know, plenty of violations of international law, international norms, but within a you know within a more traditional model of what was acceptable governance of uh, the right wing populist model we see it's not just that the people you know uh, the voters are getting there's an emphasis on you know this is what the people want etc and that's what enables them to sort of rally around a leader who will say ah the elites will never accept you i am i'm your voice the what the right wing right wing populism really does um it empowers the leader as the sole representative, the true voice of the people, and those people empowered who are empowering that leader, those are the only true people that matter in the in the in the um, in the country or in the state or in, in you know the only true patriots, the only real Americans, so to speak. Um, there's that. There's also a um, misinformation, like you say, like you know, uh, a lot of oligarchs are involved. A lot of money is moving around in the media. There's a lot of, you know, uh, whether it's uh, the Fox News model here, where for long, you know, where there's a direct feedback loop between the White House and what's going on in Fox and Friends in the morning. And then when Fox decides, you know, a little too close to reality, they move into Newsmax and like OANN, or whether that's, um, you know, Sheldon Adelson, who, you know, one of Trump's biggest donors, also explicitly setting up a daily newspaper in Israel. Hi, uh, I believe it's high Yom Yom Daily Day, specifically, you know, for pro BB coverage that gets, you know, and, you know, a free newspaper being disseminated. Um, this ties into a whole nother conversation about declining trust in media, but I won't. But yeah, this, this, these, these, uh, all these things come together in this sort of stew of you know, right wing populism to the point where um, they're not all identical. But there is a lot of rhyme, a lot of rhyme in the reasoning and, and how these and how these systems come together. And I, I see there might also be a kind of a connection between romanticizing history and, I mean, it's kind of connecting to me a little bit, I yeah. think, yeah. and the, the rise of populism, where I, I hear you saying that, that the leaders take advantage of that in order to gain power. Sure. And, and, and so why do people accept that? I mean, is, I guess, I guess, that I, all right, I understand. You're, you're saying they're romanticizing the history, so people are accepting it because of that. I think is, uh, is that possible. The, is, that, is that am I on the right track? I mean, these fractures, these these you know these big movements, they don't happen in in healthy, well-running societies. You know, uh, the the it's only in in the dire in the direst straits, so to speak, is when these opportunities, you know, is when people will turn to the promise of the promise of security, the promise of stability. And also by that same point, um, and this ties into all sorts of things like QAnon, like trying to get people vaccinated. The idea that like, you can't really convince anybody with facts anymore because facts, like the intellectual knowing of a fact, uh, you know, a provable fact about politics is not as important to folks. Folks don't want to be actually informed. Folks want to feel informed. And even more than wanting to feel informed, uh, people want an ideology, and especially ideology, a coherent way of understanding the world that's tied into community. Commun if you can provide somebody community and meaning, even more than you know, food, water, shelter, sex, people with meaning and community can do a lot of great things, they can do a lot of terrible things too. Depend if you activate those base human instincts, those human emotions, those human needs. And again, when you know, when uh, there's a reason that these things happen, you know, at particular moments, you know, uh, whether it's finan financial cri uh, crisis, 
uh, some other you know, enormous political disruption leading to a loss of faith in the established order. It's only that all oh, those dire circumstances that even make these alternatives credible to the average person. And, and you say that uh, people are trying to feel basically secure in their community and in their country. And, and then and you also talk, you, you mentioned that it doesn't happen maybe in a place where they are uh, already in that uh, category where they're feeling healthy. Now, is there yeah. a is there a is there an example of that or a world leader that is in that uh, situation? I think uh, in terms in terms of creating a healthy like I yes. guess what would the, the opposite of a yes a, of a, of this right wing populism. For a long time, uh, you a lot of people could have pointed to uh, the Scandinavian style democratic socialist welfare states. But even those are starting to to get a lot of friction in terms of uh, populist pushback, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, rallying of us against them. Um, probably in terms of lead, models of leaders who are willing to trans, sort of try to transcend uh, the political the, the political skirmishing that makes you know if your if your only concern is getting reelected and staying popular and inflaming your base that that's one thing politics by media. Uh, you could point to Finland, you could point to New Zealand, you could point to, it's really the countries, uh, you know, that don't make the news, I imagine, right, are the are the ones that we would want to look to for models of stability. Okay, all right, now, I want, I want to move, move on now. Uh, yeah. I, it's all starting to connect, you know, all these issues. It's funny. Um, you got to be careful, though, because then it then eventually it sounds like its own like conspiracy level QAnon, like I'm in front of my whiteboard, like gesturing frantically. So there's you know, it's it's all about it's all about balance perspective. OK, uh, well, um, you, you also shouted out a, a, a question. Sure. Uh, how can we learn from the past and prepare for the future while living in the present? I mean, I, I think that addresses what you just raised. So yeah. what's the answer to that? Is there an answer? I think, you know, uh, unfortunately, as far as like big society level changes or big political changes, you know, the political will, the political capital simply isn't there. Like, look at the, the skirmishes over, quote unquote, critical race theory in classrooms right now. You know, it's the latest iteration of school board teaching evolution, sex ed. Anytime uh, that politics and education mix, you know, especially, especially in the whether public sphere or private sphere, uh, it's it's stymie. It does stymie progress. So really, I think it comes down to the at the individual level, um, reading, trying to find out as much as you can, doing like your show, building these connections, building bridges uh, among like-minded people, and hopefully building enough consensus about um, among the folks who are not already agitated, the folks who are not are not fired up, you know. Um, Criticism is loud, but but respect is quiet, as they say. So, like, I guess I guess it's hard to it's hard to avoid one. You know, it seems it seems like I might on some level advocating for like going monastic or going into like a hermitage in the woods. Like, no, but like we still have to engage in society, but we have to do it in a way to sort of transcend the 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 political media kerfuffle. It's a dead end, I think. Well, well I hear you saying this is like an individual personal obligation of everybody uh, I, and in order to and not abandon society we have to think about it some more ourselves and make some distinctive choices based on our own thoughts not just go along with um, a mob if you will is, is, and it's is, not it's not easy it's it's it not easy at all much easier to join the crowd yeah or yeah. to tune out altogether. It's to say a pox on a pox on everyone's house. Hmm. Yeah. Is is there anybody in the world today that is a teacher that um, is putting forth these ideas out there, uh, or is I mean, is this something that we all have to learn on our own? I think I think a teacher can be uh, wherever wherever you find knowledge. You know, you know the the, the saying. When the student is ready, the teacher appears, and that can take a lot of different forms. And sometimes it's a it's a it's a human source. It's a, maybe uh, maybe it's a, a YouTube vid video or something on think tech, or maybe it's you encounter a, a an old you know philosophical text, 
or a, a spiritual scripture passage that you haven't encountered since you were a kid and it speaks to you. It can be any number of things that we encounter. Um, and I think, you know, different things are going to speak to different people. And, 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 and that's going to be, uh, I think, up to the individual to decide what teachers they want to look for. Okay. And what they need to be taught more and knowing, knowing where they're, where their gaps, their own, their own deficiencies, not deficiencies, that's a little harsh. Knowing, where, one of the hardest things we can do is, being, is becoming aware of where we need improvement or where we can improve. Okay, so that is a uh, intellectual consciousness choice. Now, we, in a couple minutes we have left, you've also mentioned, uh, I, I know you, you like Martin Luther King and you mentioned a quote from him. And yeah. one of the quotes that, that you mentioned uh, uh, is we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Now, uh, is that that's not necessarily intellectual? It's it's almost spiritual or sure. internal. Uh, what it, you know? What does that mean to you? And is that really possible? I mean, is is that naive? It's absolutely naive. It's it's perhaps hopelessly naive. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, um, you, you could one could argue that the 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 bleakest horrors of the 20th century and some of the bleak ones of the 21st are were caused by the, the human attempt to focus purely on intellectual uh, intellectual improvement or self improvement or to the point uh, to the point of uh, fervent purification without any counterbalancing of spirituality, of psychology, of empathy, of the things that uh, make us all so desperately human and ordinary and flawed and in need of community, in need of all, all these things that politics alone cannot necessarily provide. And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, part of the... Um, the part of Dr. King's legacy, you know, when the, I mean, the, I mean, the man was killed. The man you, at the time he was shot, you know, uh, polls had, uh, you know, suburban whites, you know, in a not insignificant amount saying, you know, they're glad saying like, that was the best thing for race relations. And the, you know, to, um, a little, un, it's a little distasteful to use the term whitewashing of that history. But when the only quote being trotted out consistently is like color of skin, not content of character. And the idea that like, and that, that, this, that segueing, I don't want to segue us all the way down back into romanticizing history. I know we're running out of time. But we have to look, we, there's, there's something beyond, there's, and whether it's, whether it's Dr. King or any of the stories we think we know, there's, there's history beyond that that we can all look to and be inspired by and learn from. Well, I want to thank you for talking with me today. I've learned a lot. And I, I hear you saying that there, there's really, we have to somehow combine intellectual and human spirituality uh, together in order to uh, maybe cross the seas together. And I, I hear that's what you're, I, I think that's what you're trying to shout out across the waves. And there's, there is noisy waves out there. Yeah. How hard but, could it be, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but thank you, Josh. Good good to have you. And thank uh, you so much, Mark. It was a, it was a real pleasure. Aloha. Take care. Bye bye.